just give a few words of introduction. So Richard Bartholomew, many of you will know, is the editor of the SRO, Social Research Journal, was previously head of profession at the Department for Education. Um, David Walker's contributing editor at Guardian Public, has had lots of different roles, is currently the chair of the Governing Board for Understanding Society, has written a number of books with Polly Toynbee around um, what's been happening to the welfare state, and also um, one that I've read, which is a really thought-provoking book about the role of the Economic and Social Research Council. So over to you, Richard, to take us through this um, session. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, are we, can you hear us okay? We've got the mics working. Right, uh, I've been introduced. I, I was part of uh, Michael Gove's, one of his in-house experts, and I, no doubt part of his blob, actually, at one stage, which I'm very honoured to have been, despite his views on it. So I take that as a compliment from him that we were um, such a challenge, clearly, to, to his understanding. But enough of that. Um, I'd like to introduce David Walker, uh, who will be known to many of you who are Guardian readers. Um, he's been an economist for The Guardian for a good many years. I think it was at the Times before that. Um, and he's still producing his weekly articles. Um, he was also, for a short while really, the Director of Public Reporting at the Audit Commission until it was abolished by the... Uh, prematurely. prematurely. Prematurely abolished by the, um, the uh, government in the, the new uh, uh, government in, in 2010, I think, wasn't it? Um, he's also uh, been a member of the ESRC Council, but that hasn't stopped him writing quite after he was, I think after he left the council, quite a critical review of the impact or lack of impact, really, of ESRC and uh, ESRC-funded research bit of an unfair summary, um, over the years, which was um, not uncontentious. Uh, and he's currently um, the chair of the governing board of the Under Understanding Society um, Longitudinal Household Panel Study and a number of other uh, activities. So he's always been deeply immersed in the world of social research, but as you can tell, not uncritical of it. And we thought we'd actually depart from the title that we was advertised, that was something of a working title, is Social Research Science, to actually engage more generally with the issues that have been raised today by the theme of the conference about social research in a sceptical age. And, it, certainly some of the issues that David wasn't here for this morning, but uh, some of the issues that are raised by uh, John, John and Pullinger and Will Moy this morning. Um, so I was, we're going to do this in sort of news night mode, and I'm, I'm not Jeremy Paxman, so <laughs> nothing too uh, aggressive in the questioning probably, uh, but I will see. Um, so I don't know, I'm going to prompt a few questions for David to, to give us the benefit of his, his very great experience in this area. And my first question is a fairly obvious one. We've touched on it many times, including in the last presentation. Um, to what extent do you think we are actually living in a post-truth, post-fact age? Or is it, as I think uh, Will Moy said, uh, a bit of a moral panic, actually? I mean, is this true? And is it actually more an American issue than a British issue? Because there are very many countervailing trends. There's the government-funded evidence-based uh, work, what works centres. There's an emphasis still on evidence-based policy. And I don't actually see much decline, some people may disagree, in social research. In fact, we've seen some trends to increase. So what, what do you think is actually happening? How seriously do we have to take this debate on post-truth? Let's kind of come into an answer to that by, if I may, a piece of very quick and dirty uh, empirical social research, which is to ask you to raise your hand if you are a university graduate. <laughs> Tim, in his presentation, used the word glancingly tribe. And there is a growing body of uh, research analysis, particularly by social uh, political scientists, about the reasons for the vote in the referendum uh, on European membership, the reason for the surprising result of the 27 UK general election, the reason for the Scottish referendum result, and of course the reasons behind the triumph of Donald Trump in the United States. And one key emerging line of explanation is the, no the notion of tribe. And it, I went to happen to go to a, a rather interesting lecture last night by David Runciman, professor at Cambridge, a political quarterly lecture, and he was beginning to move down the road of trying to explain a large chunk of the referendum result, particularly by tribal affiliation, and said quite explicitly, the single strongest determinant of the uh, referendum vote was level of education. You, us, 
university educated people belong to a distinct and it turns out much resented tribe. And uh, our possession of degrees uh, undergraduate and higher marks us out, distinguishes us, and is a source, it seems, of uh, our behaviour. And I think we do need a degree of self-consciousness about how distinct we are and how potentially determinative of, now it looks like, pretty macro-political outcomes, our membership of this particular tribe is. I mean, just a second question, if I may. Um, how many of you today have accessed Facebook? <laughs> I mean, I, I could go on. There are lots of ancillary questions, which, uh, as a part-time employee of The Guardian, are deeply interesting about access to mainstream media and the replacement, uh, the substitution of those mainstream media by uh, forms of communication, two-way, uh, which Facebook has come to uh, represent. Um, the answer to, to your question, Richard, surely is in part... Yes, there is too much evidence that deliberate falsehood, accidental falsehood, the propagation of unreason is now a very strong part of our collective lives. It's having impact in political decision making. Uh, fake news is around. Yes, fake news propaganda has always been part of the weft and waft of uh, political uh, common uh, understandings. Nonetheless, it does appear to be uh, a lot more important, which obviously raises the question as the role of those whose vocation we hope, despite um, a certain, if I may say, relativist take on uh, institutional truth-seeking by, uh, by Tim, those of you who are social researchers <laughs> surely are wedded to some vocational notion of truth-seeking. Uh, well, that was going to be my next question, really. I mean, in this climate, what is the role or what should it be of social researchers and social research in terms of the credibility of that research uh, and, and influence? How do you see what more should we be doing than we're doing currently? Well, that plays out on an individual level where... Whatever, whatever the institution you work for, if you have that commitment, it might involve you increasingly in raising your voice and potentially facing negative consequences from raising your voice in your institutional context. Those of you who may have accessed Facebook before this session might have seen that today's big political story is the appearance before a parliamentary committee of David Davies, uh, where he said in terms, yes, I, he didn't say this, but in terms, I said there were 58 impact studies showing the effect on the UK economy, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. of leaving the European Union. Uh, they don't exist. Ah. Now, by implication, civil servants advising him, civil servants who might be statisticians, who might be economists, who might be members of the uh, government, uh, government social research have been involved implicitly in what's basically a lie to the public. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose on an individual level, the difficult question is, can I stop myself being suborned by these uh, institutional lies? Uh, and that's, that's a difficult one, which we'd obviously need to tease out yeah, in we'll terms of interviews. Maybe, yeah. but I suppose the collective answer to your question is, there must be strengthen, strengthening of those institutions, and here we are in one, British Library, but in another one, the SRA, which have themselves a vocational commitment to truth. Truth as established by peer-reviewed uh, social inquiry, by the application of a body of tried and trusted methods, by the existence of a community of truth seekers. And uh, again, I, I don't want to sort of um, uh, and totally identify Tim as a, a sort of a, a, a relativist, but th 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 there is a sense in which that, that community has, and I use a strong term, a moral obligation. And I know this is something which speakers earlier today sort of maybe sort of began to say, to speak out uh, in favour at least of the methods by which truth is But isn't one of the problems that um, social science has is that there are such a variety of methods and some pretty fierce disagreements between proponents of different methods in diff quite different types of, of research and certainly within each discipline. Um, it's very hard for that community to agree 
and come to a clear view that others will understand about what is quality, what are the standards. It's easier perhaps for statistics, I don't know, but in broader areas of qualitative research and more exploratory types of research that a lot of the people perhaps in the audience are involved in, that's quite a hard task and difficult to see how we might ever arrive at that kind of acceptance of what is good quality in a way that people not involved in research would actually understand. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's a very difficult thing to tease out. But presumably, on a you know, much more superficial level, colleagues here are employed by various institutions to do a social research job because that functionality exists and is valued, it has some value to the organisation which mm. employs you. So in a sense, organisations have already supplied an answer to that. Yes, there may be a battle royal between quantitative and qualitative. There may be divisions about appropriate methods, uh, etc. But nonetheless, there presumably has to be a fundamental uh, body of function Mm. or else you all would be out of a job and mm. you wouldn't have had a distinguished career as a government social researcher. <laughs> ah, indeed. Um, yeah. Can I ask you, you touched on the issue, particularly as it affects um, people working in within government. There are quite a few members um, uh, here from uh, government departments and other public bodies. And I know in your recent articles you've been quite... Um, I don't know if critical is the right word, but you've raised the qu issue of the independence of uh, public officials and actually where they see, and the Brexit debate <laughs> has raised this in spades, where they see mistruths being spoken, um, whether, or you advocate certainly that public officials ought to have a stronger role in actually contesting that, perhaps in a more public way, uh, where they see that ministers and others are misusing that evidence. Um, and I think it might also raise issues for those who are not part of government, but research agencies, other uh, inst research institutes that supply research to government, where they also see their research being misused, misinterpreted, or actually just ignored, which is, is the perhaps more common uh, factor. I mean, what's your view of how the role of um, those involved in research and evidence in government and those supplying government with uh, research, how they might change to address that issue? Well, let, let me make a crude point. In recent years, we've heard a lot of talk about evidence for policy. The evidence for policy conversation has been denser and it's gone on a lot. I seem to have heard there's, there, there are academic journals devoted to evidence and policy. I defy anyone in this room to tell me that Brexit has been an evidence-led process. So here we have a major, major, well, at that one. major, yeah. major act of policy from which evidence, and I'm not just referring to the David Davis episode today, but evidence has been missing. Now, go, go, I mean, let's just briefly and it's, uh, address the, 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 the problems which colleagues who are civil servants face. We have to acknowledge, don't we, that this isn't the civil service's finest hour. Brexit is a major, major problem for the civil service. Now, there are good reasons to do with the denuding of departments of, of bodies. They've lost numbers. Civil service pay has been held down. Uh, there are great gaps in capacity. The Controller Auditor General has said this several times in public. Capacity in Whitehall is, is, is lacking. That said, it's extraordinary, given the number of moral professional dilemmas which already civil servants will have faced that the leader of the civil service should have said nothing by implication not even in a neutral speech said nothing about the difficulties his colleagues are facing whether they're professionals in terms of the uh, social research function economists whatever or mainstream policy or delivery civil servants there are umpteen issues which brexit brings to bear about how departments are working or not about the legitimacy of spending decisions about uh, the knowledge that departments have in terms of the in the way the uk has been enmeshed in the european union etc etc that at the very least would throw up issues which deserve some public discussion and I understand civil servants individually find it difficult to engage in public controversy. Nonetheless, there are lots of forums, the Institute for Government, speech making occasionally by permanent secretaries, where these issues can be raised. Not on a single occasion since the Brexit vote has there been an intervention by a serving civil servant, certain former civil servants have made. And I think that's a, a dreadful indictment of a, an organisation which kind of doesn't really want to learn much about mm. itself, because you learn about yourself by having views refracted back in, in a, a, a conversation. 
And I, I can only sympathise with you, those of you who are in departments which are in the, in the throes of trying to deal with this tremendous question of Brexit. And yet your support from without, your support from within appears to be uh, very uh, slender. Yeah, and do you see, I mean, think of the, what you said about impact assessments and the, the denial that they even existed. Um, I mean, these impact assessments are done, I think, for all policy initiatives um, within government. Do you think the process for actually making that evidence clearly should be more open, that they should be published? Is that a way forward? There are various institutional processes that could be put in place yeah, I mean, to know, actually um, support the hand of civil servants who are in that role of, of advising on evidence. Again, I mean, I find it quite extraordinary that as the capacity of the oversight and scrutiny function of the UK Parliament has improved, and unquestionably it has improved, or certainly over the past decade. Parliamentary committees are functioning better. They could be so much better, they could mm. be much more coordinated, they could use much more research, they could be more forensic. However, they're better. That During that period, people inside the machine in Whitehall haven't tried to use that as a mechanism, for example, for extending the conversation about what can and can't be placed in mm -hmm. the public domain. Uh, and, it, it, I mean, you know, one's not advocating that this should overnight be the publication of all the materials that are available inside departments. No, but there are lots and lots of ways. I mean, there are academic forums within which you might think civil servants could come. And some, you know, this happens to some extent, I know, but it could and should happen to a much greater extent. And so the sort of the, the, the cognitive activity of government becomes a shared thing rather than, at the moment still, a hugely private enterprise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think the role of um, the research council, particularly research councils, particularly ESRC, should be in this? You were very critical, perhaps, of their previous lack of impact in, in a number of uh, areas, or in all areas, perhaps. And we now have the new UK research and innovation uh, umbrella structure, which is bringing together all the different research councils with a sort of super board, which has got two people who are... I think friends of, of social science that are on the board, at least two probably, uh, one an ex-minister. Um, what do you see? I mean, is, it, is that structure um, going to increase the volume of evidence, the quality of evidence, the, the impact of social science evidence um, within the policy framework and more broadly? Or is that actually that new structure, would you say, a threat to social science? How do you, what, as a former member of the ESRC Council, how do you see that as a threat or opportunity? On a kind of banal uh, institutional level, clearly it, it, it's a threat. This new, uh, colleagues know, this new envelope, UKRI, will be established on the 1st of April uh, next year. The existing research councils will be, in a sense, downgraded. They'll, they'll become advisory committees with an executive chair, and there's a new, newly appointed executive chair of the ESRC who takes office in the new year, Jennifer Rubin, King's College. And, but her grading in the sort of hierarchy as a, a single research council chair will be considerably less potent than her predecessor. In Whitehall terms, she will not be an accounting officer when the previous uh, chief executive of the ESRC was an accounting officer. So there's an, unquestionably an institutional downgrading for the individual uh, research councils. Um, but a slightly more interesting answer is to say, the, the question's been answered already. The government within the past fortnight has produced a new industrial strategy. It is, in terms of its rhetoric, very, very heavily STEM. It's really saying the productivity problem of the UK, which obviously is a science, social science identified problem because economists mm. have done a lot mm. of work on it, is to be solved by more maths, um, more engineering, more technology, more productive manufacturing. Even though we know manufacturing is only barely 10% of UK GDP, it's still sort of in the center of the, the vision for the industrial strategy. And the presence in that thinking about the future of productivity in the UK economy of social science inflected uh, institutional organisation analysis is very, it's seemingly very slight. We all know that the UK is a service-based economy. How you secure productivity improvement in service institutions is a difficult question, which some social scientists have devoted some considerable effort to. But recognition of that in the industrial strategy mm. by Greg Clark, who is himself a social scientist, Indeed. by the way, yeah. um, has been, isn't there. 
And I, so my, my worry is not that Mark Wolpert, the chief executive of UKI, will come in and say, I don't like sociology, I'm going to... He, he's too sophisticated a man for that. In fact, what he will say is, I don't want the aggravation of, of you lot, social scientists sort of making a big noise, so I'm actually going to soft pedal. Uh, the social science thing and let it go on for a considerable period as it has. Although, we'll come back to this, maybe there yeah. are very big questions pending, not least of which the future of longitudinal studies, which are a high, high cost investment for the ESRC. Mm. But I, I, so I don't think UKI is going to come in heavy footed and say we're going to you know, do, do bad things to the social sciences. But in terms of where the action is and UKRI's attention is, industrial strategy, forward movement, the UK economy, and so on. It's mm. the absence of a social science awareness in that sphere that worries me much okay. more. But what are some of the opportunities? I mean, one of the reasons for linking up the different search councils is particularly in the, what was termed the biosocial aspect. Uh, and there have been quite a big... I know you were involved with the, on the board of Biobank, were you? On, uh, ethics mean, and government. There do board, seem yeah. to be quite a lot of advantages there in terms of link, making this important linkage between social data and biological data, particularly with the new developments on DNA and genetic analysis. I mean, are there not some opportunities there that this kind of structure will actually facilitate? You hate to use that terrible C.P. Snow cliche about two cultures, but I, I, just very briefly, I, I, I'm on the, what's a body called the Ethics and Governance uh, Council of UK, Biobank, which is this tremendous... Uh, resource, 500,000 people have, have donated data and their uh, progress towards death will be recorded uh, as over the next, uh, for however long we last, a um, few years. Um, uh, You're not the, 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 guy, the guy who uh, is the principal investigator is a hugely distinguished uh, Oxford University-based uh, scientist. His social science understanding is incredibly small <laughs> and he uh, and the chair of UK Biobank don't see that social data we we will say quite obviously I mean the environment the household structure the conditions of employment of people who are being monitored is surely quite important to get a, a picture of the potential impact on their health of you know their prior circumstances mm. it's you know it's an interesting longitudinal study but A, social data weren't collected initially, or rather small, only small bits of social data were collected. And the, the, the opportunity to bind in some rather interesting social science data mm. into that biological uh, material is going by the board. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, that's, that shows that you know, we are still, I don't want to you know, create frictions, but we are still a hugely STEM-dominated science yeah science culture and so social science still struggles to kind of knock keep knocking on the door and say mm. remember us remember us mm. instead of us being sort of you know recognized to be inside the tent with something interesting to say because yeah. i mean you know you all know there is you know a huge amount of emerging material about the the interconnectedness mm. of the uh, mm. biosocial mm. Can I change tack again going back to slightly some of the issues we raised earlier really i'm um, focusing on your your career as a journalist, because I think a lot of people who are, most of us are not journalists, a lot of people in the audience would quite like to know your opinion on how researchers, or the producers of research, the disseminators of research, can actually attract the attention of the media in good ways, not just bad. And really to ask you as a journalist, what actually about research grabs your attention and that of your colleagues, those may be different things, um, to actually have impact? Because there's so much emphasis from research funders on impact, but often we struggle a bit to know what works, particularly with the media, though there are other sorts of important impact as well beyond just the media. But what is it about research that grabs your attention and what doesn't? And what can researchers do about that? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I've banged on to you about that. I mean, we, we have to be aware that we in Britain have, perhaps unlike other countries in Europe, certainly un oddly unlike the press in the United States, a hugely politicised press, material that has political charge to it, and a lot of social research necessarily is politically coloured, runs up against the fact that a chunk of the press, Telegraph, Mail, Times, etc., 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 are politicised in the sense that they're owned by people who think of them as vehicles for ideology and political attainment as much as to make money. No question about that. So that's, you mm -hmm. certainly have to factor that in. Now, of course, there are, we have a more plural media than that. There's the BBC, there's social media, etc., etc. To answer your question bluntly, um, 
increasingly it's not just a finding, but it's a finding with a recommendation for action. I, I've done, forgive me for blowing my own trumpet, but I've done a Go ahead. Blog, blog today for LSE's Impact Blog, looking at the demise of the Social Mobility Commission. Uh -huh. Here you had something created by the Labour government, uh, carried on, Nick Clegg says it was down to him, into the coalition years. Successive reports, all credit to Alan Milburn and Gillian Shepherd and Paul Gregg, uh, who's on the commission. Mm. Successive State of the Nation reports, making extensive use of social research data. You know, it's there. If you want citations for REF 2021, go there. But the Social Mobility Commission is dead. Milburn's walked, the government says, oh, we'll, we'll reappoint. But even if they did find someone with any credibility to chair the commission, it, it's over. And Milburn's walked because he says, our findings have been ignored. This government, he said the other day, does not want to know about how you would begin to address. Now, we can have an argument about their def definition of social mobility. They mean deprivation, inequality, and so on. But you know, he's saying there are major social problems in Britain. They're not being addressed by the government. Now, one of the problems with social, particularly social science research is it'll make the finding about inequality, particularly longitudinal data, great. You know, you can see, you know, conditions before birth, conditions at birth, yeah. conditions afterwards in the childhood. Sim simple elegance, yeah. Lead to, or connected, if not directly causally, then certainly heavily, yeah. significantly involved with life chances, life outcomes. What do you do about it? That's the question that'll make the story. If you say, here's the finding, and here is a way in which you can do something about poverty, about inequality, about life chances. And that, that's that missing element. So, that, I mean, my partner, you'll know, um, Polly Toynbee, she happened to bump into a distinguished social researcher, she was just telling me before I came out, called John Hills. John Hills the LSE this morning. Mm. And Polly did a column the other day, sort of saying, you know, social research, great, but we need to have recommendations for action. Whether the recommendations are followed is a whole other question, but at least you've got a roadmap. And the question is who actually, if you, the social researchers, say, oh, the roadmap's not for us, that's for somebody else to do. Who is that somebody else? Mm -hmm. Because you'll know, you, you particularly and your colleagues in government, actually devising public policies that will deliver, deliver to these really, you know, these wicked issues educational under attainment, uh, labour market access, delivery, delivering policies that will change that is mm. the key. Uh, I think we now need to move to tea. Uh, and so I'd like to thank David very much for his thoughts. Thank you.